So, any questions from that? So I'm not giving a worksheet because it's hard to take notes on the video, so I kind of give the questions, the folks that make you think about something. That was we couldn't get? Yes. 22. What is it? Um, in 1928, Herbert R. defended Al Gerber Hoover, Republican. Who did he defeat? Al Smith. Al Smith. And I'll show you, it might be a little more than anti-Catholic bias, too. She was the most pretty intense anti-Catholic bias. We mentioned that going back to nativism back in the 1840s. Any others? Yes. What, what's the question on that? Say it again. Organized crime. Organized crime. For number five, organized crime. And you notice it's small, so you can, you can be very concise. And you can have you, you can show off your very good eyes. See, I'm doing that for you. You're welcome. So, he's going to go and talk about the 1920s. I'm filming this. Hope we'll have the DBQs tomorrow, but there's still a couple people need to do them. And everyone did blue or black pen. That's a cool scene. They had color film. This style would go away and no one's really sure how they did it. That's New York City, 28. I like that picture. All right, so. Yeah, when other cars finally coming up with better, better ways to paint cars. The Model T had to adapt. In fact, he just got rid of it and made the Model, the, the, the model A, which is a great car. So, let's get to a couple things really quick. First off, Rob DeWall was a horrible depression. So, yes, we're isolationists, um, much more conservative and foreign policy wise, but also it started with this horrible recession. And the thing was, demobilized the army, demobilized all the factories from, uh, that finally just started producing mil uh, military equipment to consumer, inflation skyrocketed in the first half of the year, and then the economy totally crashed. And we're talking skyrocketed as in prices doubled in the first half of the year. And then, then all the factories had to go from producing, retooling, it's called, changing their machine tools from um, back from military to consumer goods. So here, a lot of workers, they're paid to not keep up, this is on strike. The GDP is called the gross national product, and it's a, a way, a very crude way to measure the size of the economy. They still use it today, even though it does, it's pretty incomplete, all the goods and services are sold. But here is the decline in the GNP in 1919 through 21. So pretty big decline and decent growth for the 20s, and then I think you know what's coming here. By the way, what's the GNP doing today? Skyrocket. We're in such a boom, it's hard to even wrap our mind around. It's one of the biggest booms, maybe the biggest boom in my lifetime. The economy is doing, it's uneven, but just doing so well. Yes, I know everyone's complaining about gas prices going up 40 cents, but the economy is booming. Yeah, sometimes people's perception don't match reality. Of course, then again, reality, of when it's uneven, don't have a lot of money, the price going up just a little bit, it's a big deal. So. It's very uneven. So back to this. So this would trigger a whole wave of strikes. Strikes all over the United States. And the thing was, with prices going up, wages did not keep up. Wages did not keep up with inflation. And the thing was, wages were going up. Prices were going up a lot faster. Workers didn't strike during the war as an element of patriotism, fight for the war effort. But when the war, after, the war ended, it's really going to start in, I put on Seattle, Seattle actually started here with longshoremen. There's an app that's 50,000 workers walked out. And then Boston, especially the Boston Police Department. The police officers who had been working, a lot of police officers were working an average of 70 hours a week. 70 to 80 hours a week. What am I saying? Some of them working seven, 12 hour shifts. Now, your concept of a weekend, 
did not exist yet. Labor unions will fight and get that in the late 1930s. It's not here yet. But there'll be steel strikes and, uh, and uh, violent battles that will, strikers are going to be brutally attacked by police and private guards. But in West Virginia, they literally called them the Coalfield Wars. There's some miners right there, bloody, horrible fighting, especially in the town of little mining town of Maywan, where workers were shot by mostly uh, Pinkerton guards. And the National Guard would be called out to force workers to take lower contracts. A couple hundred would be killed or wounded and violently put down. And eventually, union membership would drop dramatically throughout the decade. But you have this wave of strikes. At the same time, there's a series of anarchist attacks. So right after the war, all of a sudden, there are a bunch of anarchist bombings. And there are over 50 mail bombs or package bombs sent out, including a bomb sent to the home of Attorney General Palmer. And so obviously, an assassination attempt. The Biggest will actually also be one of the last. We have to wait to the next year, but in September, a Wall Street bombing will kill 38 people. See those cars turned over and flipped over? That's from the explosion of the bomb. It was a, a bomb hit in a delivery car. And Wall Street, kind of the center of financial capitalism, that's where the anarchists attacked it. Actually, anarchism would uh, drop dramatically. It was already dropping by then. But this wave, the fear of maybe the enemy is still attacking us. Remember that idea of total war, that there's an end, there could be an enemy within, and we have to root out those who might be subversive. And remember the target of acts like the Espionage Act or the Sedition Act were Germans, but also socialists. Anarchism is the most radical kind of socialism, combined with the strikes, is going to lead to this real fear. Were the strikes and bombing a fight for workers' rights? Or was it the revolution? Was it the revolution? They worried about it during the war, but the fear didn't end, and the Bolshevik revolution was here. Here's an anti-Bolshevik cartoon turning back the time, the clock of civilization. And here is Uncle Sam beating a coal miner. Over 200 miners were dying every week in West Virginia coal fields. And yet, the strike was seen as radical. But it also tells you the point of view of the newspaper. So that's going to lead to the Red Scare. The first Red Scare, this anti, or this radical, this crazy fear of Communists and Bolsheviks. So here's, but it was mostly anti union. They just went after labor unions, destroyed them, arrested them, destroyed the IWW. The head of the IWW, Big Bill Hayward, was exiled to Russia. They just sent him to Russia. And here's one do you know anything about the IWW? And what town had a lot of people arrested for being, what town in Montana for being IWW members? Yeah, Butte. And here are Reds being kicked out by a group of pretty right wing, you know, especially kind of rapidly anti communist veterans called the American Legion, formed after the war. Attorney General Palmer, who was a little shaken by the assassination attempt, led these raids and remembered the Espionage Act. That was a law they arrested them on. It's no coincidence that this happened after World War I and the second Red Scare after World War II. It's no coincidence. At the same time, the effects of the Great Migration were just beginning to be felt. African Americans moved north in huge numbers. Beginning 1910, but really when the war work began for jobs. But they had to move to big cities. Remember sundown towns where they would not where people who are not white would not be allowed in. And so hundreds of thousands of African Americans would flee the repression of the Jim Crow South and sharecropping to go to still segregated, but better in places like Chicago, especially Detroit, New York. They don't have it here, but Omaha, a huge influx there, and that's how come 
in my mom's memory of that, so very clear. And all of a sudden, you were, where are these new migrants going to live? Will they be segregated like the South? Will white neighborhoods allow people who are not white in? This was a big issue, all blowing up at the same time. And this will trigger, oh, here's the thing about an agent help for enticing Negroes into a housing development. So they're held like sued. That's self-explanatory. Here, you're having trouble. We will help you for migrants coming from the South because they're being so horribly mistreated. That's going to lead to what's called Red Summer. And Red Summer, you notice I put in quotes, will be a series of riots. And it was almost always started by whites attacking blacks in over 60 cities across the United States. Washington, D.C. had one of the biggest, but there are big ones in Chicago. Omaha, this is Omaha, a black man murdered on the street in Omaha. It's uh, the north side of Omaha. I know exactly where some of the big uh, scenes were. And there's more different those from the longer. And all over, almost all of them would be triggered by one of two events, either a, a black man who was arrested, maybe even shot by police, or, and that happened in, in uh, Chicago, or a black man accused of raping a white woman, which was almost always not racist. That was turning into rape. Those are almost always what happened. And yeah, Red Summer, because of how many people died, the blood. Hundreds would be killed. We don't know the exact number. And this would rage all summer. Now, I'm going to 1921, but the last and the one that kind of just, especially after American resign, this is the way it would have accepted, would be in Tulsa in 1921, where hundreds of African Americans would be arrested or, or would be murdered on the streets. It started the same deal. A black man was accused of rape. He was in prison. A white mob brought, um, broke him out, actually with the help of the police, and lynched him. And this is going to trigger a series of wrenches, lynches. And then mobs of white men with bats and rifles and kerosene burnt down the segregated section of town called Little Africa. And their prosperous, relatively prosperous downtown was called Little Wall Street. And they burnt it all down. They just found a mass grave of African Americans in the 1921 riot in Tulsa three years ago. About 50 bodies just stacked into a pit. They just found it. And no one ever talked about this. Yes, the Klan was most certainly involved. And yeah, there's some controversy if we showed about last year or two about whether or not the Klan's burnt crosses. I know some people say they didn't. I only know my personal experience where my great grandfather on my father's side. The Klan burnt a cross on his yard. He ran him off with a shotgun because they thought he was Jewish or Mormon. So that's what happened to him. That was near, that was near Weeping Water, Nebraska. Ah, oh, Nebraska. And the Oklahoma Air National Guard even sent their tiny air force and bombed Little Africa during the Tulsa riots. And so with that, there's going to be a big backlash against this, and not you would think like, what about the people who were attacked? No, it was going to be that Bolsheviks and Reds were inciting blacks to revolt, including you see from this paper right here. Um, this is from the New York Times. Here, Georgia White's burned down five neighborhood churches. That's from the New York Herald. Here's an article from a Chicago paper trying to rally, um, rile people up, saying Negroes plan to kill all whites. We must stop them first. Here's National Guard in Washington, D.C., right in front of the Capitol. So with that, this can only mean one thing. Who's back? The Klan on a Ferris wheel. Yes, I can't make that picture up. Members of the Klan taking a ride on a Ferris wheel. By the way, the Ferris wheel is brand new. The first Ferris wheel was in 1893. Steam power. That would have been really cool if they would have found it. Yeah. It was massive. Well, that's Chicago yes, we know. A certain serial killer. Is that what you're thinking of? Yes. 
Some people say he was the first, but probably not the first. <laughs> no, there was a lot before that. The first one they dubbed serial killer. <laughs> There's unfortunately a lot. I know, I know. But it's an interesting story, isn't it? So these thoughts show the expansion of the Klan after 1915. Look how quickly it spread throughout the United States. Yes, there was a Klan in the South, but they never had the political power that the Klan's going to have in the Plains, the Midwest, and the West. The Klan was big in California and Oregon, really big. The Klan was really big in Montana. So these are all memberships. And yes, there's in the South, but never had the political party. So the Klan is back. The KKK. And their idea was true American. I have no idea why I put a comma after anti catholic but I did. Maybe I was going to type something else in and then forgot and moving on. But their biggest targets were all immigrants, especially anti-Semitic. I put down anti-Jew to be clear, even though they would have hated Arabs too. And of course, anybody from Asia, but it was really, of course, racist and anti-Catholic. So it's more than just anti uh, descendants of Slavs. And so I just put down this one to remind you. Remember, the Klan got to start after, we mentioned this movie before, Birth of the Nation. It, it got started here in 1913, but blew up after the war. Why? Red Scare, anarchist attacks, labor unions, Red Summer. That's why. And that's why I blew up in the North, to keep these new migrants from our neighborhoods, from our neighborhoods, keep them out. And here's a member of the Klan. He's standing, sitting on the pole with the Holy Bible in his hand. I like how they have the, the, uh, the hood smiling very frequently. Here's the big rally in 1924. And I should add, it was equal opportunity. I should have put on GOP, but I put down reps for Republicans. The Klan, their Klan members, huge members in both the Democratic and Republican Party. For example, there was no Republican Party in the South, so all the Klan members were Democrats. But north of that, it, there are a lot of Republican Klan members. Here's the 24 Democratic Convention, and it's showing the big controversy for, okay, there's the donkey. And it's showing right here, okay, the wet is anti-prohibition. The dry is for prohibition. So there are a lot of wets in the Democratic part, uh, Party, Catholics. Here, I love the Ku plus question. Get it? Question? Get it? I know it hurts me too. Here's the 28 Republican convention showing all the different groups, like the money people and all that, but there's the Klan. And so, both parties. That is no coincidence you put all of these together and you're the most restrictive anti-immigration law in American history. And it would be on the books for 41 years, the National Origins Act. And it basically divvied the world up into certain areas and said, we're only going to allow you know, very few immigrants from anywhere, but the few we allow most will be from Western Europe. A tiny amount from Southern Europe, and that's it. On that graph, the blue are immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. You notice by 1920, that was most of the immigrants. But then it went down dramatically, and the number of immigrants went down. What about people outside Europe? Did they allow them in? Not at all. Nobody from Asia. Nobody from Africa. Latin America was a little more complex, but basically no. So this was an intensely anti-immigration body. The idea was, we'll keep out dangerous immigrants. And it wasn't just those who might be Bolsheviks. You notice it's like a funnel, and we'll keep those immigrants to just a trickle of the good ones. But I want to be very clear about it. Where they divided everyone up, and they did this very cautiously, was by race, meaning those who were not non-white, not allowed in. So by skin pigment, they literally went through areas all over the world and decided if they were white or not white and therefore to be allowed in. They literally went through. Remember I told you they were still talking anywhere from 36 to 39 different races and they wouldn't categorize all of them and say, okay, they're white, white, eh, not white, they won't be allowed in. Different, totally different quota 
So, for example, the brand new country of Turkey came out of the Ottoman Empire, was both European and Asian. And it was a massive debate in 1924. Are, will immigrants from Turkey be considered white and therefore allow a few in? And it was really controversial. And so they decided, yes, immigrants from Turkey are white, but immigrants from, let's say, French Syria, they're not white. Right there. The same thing, but that's how they did it. It was an obsession with color of skin in the 1920s. And race was around everything. And so this idea was we can't allow these inferior races to breed pretty good stock. And it came up with this term, and I should have done this better, but make sure you know the word eugenics. Because eugenics was we have to we have to make sure that we have the right races in and have selective breeding. You don't want to have inferior races or people breeding in the United States because that inferior breed, inferior breed will take over and the United States will be weaker. Selective breeding. Now, eugenics starts what fake science was developed in the 80s, 1890s about kind of superiority of certain people. Remember social Darwinism? It's intense social Darwinism. But now it's got this sciencey attitude. So here is a human ascent implying here's humans, and we have, you notice it's by rank, Caucasian, and then a few of the other races like Chinese, Hottentot, and Australian all below. And if you mix the races, we will be weaker. And here's one, an article, this is from the New York Times in 1926. Heredity is a big problem. Home for feeble minded is filled with those whose parents were not as carefully selected as dairymen breed cattle. This was not an idea, or not uh, an idea that was out of the mainstream. This was a very much talked about, shaped people's attitudes. Not everyone agreed, but it was there. And certain people in other countries, like in Europe, really liked this eugenics thing from the United States and took it there. Does anyone know what country I'm referring to? It's not Luxembourg. Yeah, this came from the United States. So I don't take away from that German nationalistic and Aryans and all that garbage, because it was garbage science, but they took the eugenics and used it in Germany. In fact, they talked a lot about this. We like what the United States does. So there's a complex history here. Ironically, though, Despite segregation and, and forced to live in certain areas of big cities, the red summer, a cultural identity formed with these mi migrants coming north. And more and more we see it called like an urban culture. Personified by, and I don't know why I didn't type it in, but this is the first wave of jazz music, 1920s jazz. There's the great Cap Calloway and his orchestra. But this flowering of now African-American culture outside of the South, outside the sharecroppers, mixed in with all the different groups in there. You know, it's really a hodgepodge, which is the great thing about America. Jazz is a hodgepodge of different groups. And there's a club in Harlem called the Cotton Club, which would be the cross-section of all this different cultural tie-ins in Harlem, which was at that time very much an area where African-Americans could live in New York City. And would become a symbol of this Harlem Renaissance while these others were going on. And this ties in why they, part of the reason why we call this the Roaring Twenties. Here's the 1920s. But, a couple things about it. Sure, it was Roaring. There's Cap Calloway right there, by the way. He still, his band, he still performed well into the 1980s. He was in his 80s. That's pretty remarkable. This is mostly a myth, though. There's uh, the myth of how much fun and glamour there was, the prosperity, and this kind of worship of this individual achieving so much was really a myth. Who's that across the Atlantic? Do you remember? Who's that guy? Yeah, Charles Lindbergh. But it was kind of, it was a myth. Lindbergh had a whole team in front, and a plane already crossed. It just had a crew of six. This had been done many times, actually, by 1927. 
But this weird myth, but it hit the reality. And the reality for Islam is one very clear thing. The decade began with a depression and ended with an even worse depression. The prosperity was very uneven and most people were left behind. But it's hard to find a decade that doesn't have um, a lot of myth. And you know, I could, you know, the, the myths of the 1950s when I was when I was uh, around, in the, I was around in the 1970s, pretty big. And that could lead to only one thing: a massive elk on wheels. Because we know the 1920s was a complex era. I was actually looking for a, a, a flow from the Vigilante Parade, so. It's not it, but it, I found it out. So this would be the beginning of the growth of, they started calling it more and more conservatism. And this is getting closer to what we would consider conservatism today. What do we have a quiz tomorrow on? Chapter 23 through 32, okay? I figure we just go from there. 100 questions, are we good? Now, most of them will be up here. Most of them will be up here, up here. So bring good shoes, right? One more little thing. There will be homework over spring break. I told you, I did not hide that from you, did I? But what do you get after the test and after our finals? It's gonna be nothing but what? Fitness, running. I'm gonna add bear crawl. We're gonna do time bear crawl. Sound good? Like uh, four laps around the school, bear crawling in under three minutes. That seems fair, right? The problem is, can I find a comfortable enough chair for me to sit and watch you do that? That's actually my biggest crisis. Don't you feel my pain? Don't you feel it? I had to get my picture taken. We, we, we wore Hawaiian shirts. And it's green. Some of you aren't wearing green. Green, good, green. No. Okay, good. Green. Paul, where's your green? That's not blue. That is blue. Gray? That's blue. That's blue. It's like a... Oh, that's... That's... That's green. Uh... Uh... Yeah, you can really just turn on your notebook. Okay, green hat. Green? Oh, there's a little gray. Okay, I'll let it go. Oh, green. Uh, uh, why? Why is Colorado State is now losing? It's not good. Colorado State's now down. Yes. Oh, Michigan. They're down by six with 4.30 left. All right, six, two, three. And what, where, what's that in the South? Yeah, I did went to my Harvard Bay today. I walked on the entire school. This is just a plan. You just pull you out of the thing. I'm over here in the manual. You just pull you out of the thing. Yeah, I was like, why is it so much? 